know a handful of you, but there are definitely some familiar, familiar and new faces. So thanks for having me this morning. Um, I like to think back on 2020, and I think we should all remember something positive that came out of a worldwide global pandemic, and that would be, for me, I was married and still you know, continued to have the ceremony in a very different way, um, but I think that we should all remember that. There's always a silver lining in every situation, and we can remember that you know, with our customers, in our daily lives, uh, and, and in my situation, um, you know, on the farm. So, so yes, um, I work for one of the citrus, and I would like to preface that I am no means the all-knowing individual in citrus. It's an ever-growing industry, just like equipment solutions are. So I'll do the best I can, uh, but but I do not know everything. I never will. That should be remembered uh, during this presentation, but uh, I do the best I can. So let's let's start. Overall, first I, I just want to go over you know wonderful citrus and a few points um, before we get into the day-to-day -day operations. We we um, you know we have multiple nurseries and, and we're just gonna kind of go an overview and then we'll specify on uh, a month to month. This is very simple, but you know I think it's important to understand um, everybody that a ranch for us is from 10 acres to 2,500 acres. So the term ranch is very broad uh, and, and that's very important to remember. And just kind of a fun slide that I found, I mean, it's one football field is is what an acre is, which is you know, equivalent to 18 average size homes. So it's, it's you know it's a lot of a lot of area, right? Just for one acre, and we're having a ranch that's from 10 to 2,500 acres. So just for perspective, also I think that's helpful for you know for water. The average acre of citrus is about uh, three acre feet per year. So I mean, it's a lot of a lot of water, yes, but I mean, just for for an overall understanding. So wonderful citrus, we're we're um, quite large, and in uh, the Central Valley area, you know, we're about thirty-one thousand acres, um, and you know Mexico, we're, we're a, a large player too, and, and along with Texas, and these numbers have since grown. The last couple of years uh, as well. This is, uh, as a whole, you know, we have about 900 employees, myself included, as, as being one of those, and uh, that that is not including the contract labor that we do use throughout the season. Uh, nursery, we have a few nurseries, um, like Celia Porterville, Texas. Uh, we we do about a million trees a year throughout these nurseries. Um, root stocks are very important for characteristics because in, in you know, different soil makeups you have sandy loom, I mean you have a, a plethora of soil platforms and um, as I'll go into in the next couple slides, it's it's very important to choose the correct root stock for you know the given area that you're choosing to plant an orchard. And, that's a very, you know, so you, so you have a, a, you're growing a root stock and then you're, you're going to uh, go ahead and bud the desired variety that you have of choice, you know, which is based on the market the market that you're trying to enter. Um, and, and this is a very changing all the time, um, similar to, I, I would like to, to have a, a, similar to table grapes, how varieties are constantly changing. <coughs> You know, new breeder programs, very similar to citrus. You're always looking for the next best variety that, that closes the market, um, closes the gap in the market. So you have a, a 365 crop. This is a big deal 
right now it's just greening, um, so it's really a ton long bean. Um, and this is the number one fear in citrus growing right now. Um, this, I was actually, as I was in the parking lot, I was in a, a conference call um, with an update. And this right now, so you have a Asian citrus psyllid is the vector, what they call the vector. And essentially, um, the psyllid is, will fly to, um, I mean, it's a, a psyllid is a bug, and it flies and will land on um, new flush growth uh, in a citrus orchard. And right now, uh, they will carry uh, HLB, which is the disease, and they will infect the tree. And unfortunately, right now, there is no cure for that tree. Uh, you may not see the disease for up to two years, and it will, the tree will be dead within five years. Um, there is no cure. And it's very, very prevalent in Florida, it's prevalent in Texas, it's prevalent in Southern California. Thankfully, we have not had a commercial um, infected tree in Kern County um, from north of uh, Arvin. So, there is not a commercial, in, in Kern County, there is not a commercial infected tree right now. Um, and that was as of, you know, we had just listened to 20 minutes ago. So, um, that's that's a great positive aspect. There, there has been um, some infestation in um, some homes, you know, in, in, the, in the city of Arvin uh, that they have treated for, which means, you know, you're, you're taking out the tree. So that, it is close, and that is a huge fear, because once infected, um, I mean, it has ripped apart the Florida industry, and uh, they're continuing to, to study and learn what they can. Um, right now, um, just for, for an interesting aspect, whenever this, this Asian citrus psyllid um, lands, they start on the outside of the block, and they work their way in, and so, they essentially infect the trees, and it's it's, just, it's a barrier. So ideally, you want to treat um, treat the infected area. And what that means is because there's no known no cure, if the tree's infected, the tree's going to die. But if you have an Asian citrus psyllid, it doesn't always mean that you have HLB. So it's you know kind of a complicated um, overall issue but the if you notice you know we're constantly scouting um, the Department of Food and Agriculture is always scouting because this is such a citrus industry is huge in this valley. It's a money maker and it also produces you know a lot of food for the population across the world. So um, it, big deal and uh, right now, if you have Asian citrus psyllid, uh, the way they're treating it in Southern California is uh, two forms of treatment. You're going to have a foliar spray, and you're also going to have a soil applied uh, through chemigation in, in the irrigation system. And and that's just to to reduce the population. And that's the other issue is that you, we cannot physically treat or test every single tree. So you're just trying to reduce the population of the vector in the Asian citrus psyllid that could have the HLB disease. Once the disease is in the tree, the tree is done. Um, so, orchard development, I mean, this is carrying the ground for citrus. This is very important, that's why I said for soil is analyzed um, for the rootstock, depending on where you're the orchard is going to be planted. And that's very important. Um, a, a good rootstock and choosing a good rootstock, having the quality of the nursery, um, you know, with your quality control and kicking out bad trees before they ever get to the orchard is the number one um, solution for having a healthy orchard in the beginning. Uh, there's been, in other industries, there has been issues in nurseries in the past that have been detrimental to the industry. And so that's very important to remember whenever you're analyzing the soil, you're, you're trying to see what's suitable um, 
for growing in that given region. And we're using you know, very large equipment. Um, this, this would be, for most growers, would be contracted um, because that, that piece of equipment is very expensive. And um, you know, we're going to be, if we pur purchase, um, for example, a, a table grape orchard, you know, we're going to remove the orchard first, and then we're going to come in here, and we're, we're going to do a deep rip about six feet. Um, down, and we're going to do um, very close. Um, the best example would be um, track over track. So you're going to you're going to deep rip for six feet, and then you're going to drive on top of that with your other track and, and closely rip. Depending if you're planting north south or east or west, it's going to be if you're going to just rip north south. Also, knowing what was there before. Um, Asking you know, any information from the previous grower or owner um, is very helpful because in a lot of in a lot of cases um, we may only do a single directional rip for cost savings. Um, but if you don't know, it's very important to, to break up the earth below for percolation down the road um, to do a, a cross rip as well. Um, people have different opinions on. Whether or not it's it's helpful to have wings at the bottom, which helps shatter even more um, down below. I mean, the root zone for citrus is about 36 inches, so that's plenty. Um, it's just a preferential decision um, on whether or not you you know you have that additional wing, and, and what that is is on this six foot shank. Um, there's it's about a foot off on either side. People make them, depends on the ripper, depends on the grower, what he wants, he or she wants. It's very dependent on a case by case um, individual. And after that, you know, we're, we're gonna, you're gonna disc, um, it's probably two passes, break ball pods, and then you're probably gonna land plane, um, especially depending on, for example, uh, developing orchard. Uh, two years ago, and um, we decided to, to push over um, a lot of the ground to, to level it out, and then we came in with uh, land plane. So, I mean, there's we rearranged the roads, and it was much more functional for us and for drainage in, in the future, is what we believe. And then you're going to go on to the low ground, you know, irrigation, main line, lateral lines. Um, that's how you know, these trees are going to get irrigated. Um, and uh, some people use berms that historically do not use berms in a citrus orchard. Um, probably in about the uh, early 2000s, um, berms were starting to become um, a trend, if you will. And the idea is that you're not going to saturate your root zone um, with, you know, oversaturate your root zone with water. Um, we are actually going back to flat ground because of some potential issues that we've had um, in, in berms. So that's going to be very dependent upon you know, who's, who's in charge, um, their different beliefs and thoughts as well. Um, I think both grow a, a great piece of fruit at the end of the day in citrus. Um, you know, and then for after the berms are made or flat ground, um, you're going to either mark the straws with hand crews, contract labor, or now it's been more recent um, that there are crews that um, there's an automation um, contract individuals that are, are coming in and, and putting in straws. Um, that's still, still very new in my area where I'm in, I'm in McFarland. Um, we to this date have only used hand straw crews. But as labor you know, is increasing and, and we're paying above um, minimum wage, and this is a piece rate job. So it's about 50 cents a straw. I mean, it's very expensive. Um, and as, as rates you know, continue to increase, we will be forced to do only mechanic. Uh, we can't afford it. Um, and, but, but that's just you know, very crude historically with good straw. But these guys use, um, they're, they're using, Binoculars. They're using surveyor equipment. I mean, it's it's very well done. It just takes longer because you're using it. Um, 
So the average tree, uh, it's, a, I mean, it's, a, it's a little bit thicker than a pencil when we get it. And that's nine to 12 months. They used to be doing about a year, year and a half. And when they realized that the tree would make it, um, of course you want to push out more trees in the nursery, so we need to find space. But we are planting a tree at really at nine months old. Um, and these are, for example, last year and the year before, um, as I had the opportunity to, to, to manage that, um, we are manually laying out the trees. And, and for us, um, we set it up that we're planting about 20,000 trees um, a day, and that'll be done in about an hour and a half. Um, by hand, and that is, you know, very much of my job is to to uh, make it happen. And there is crews that we have work at night, um, and we'll lay out these trees in at night with lights on the straw. And you'll come during the day, and it's very impressive um, to see these guys. They'll plant about 600 trees, the fast guys, in an hour and a half, and they'll plant about, if you're, if you're slow, you're planting 350 trees in an hour and a half. Um, it's very impressive. Um, and then, you know, after that, we're, we're gonna, if you do the burn or flat, like I said, it's you know, preferential, then um, you're, we're gonna irrigate um, to try to, get the air pockets out of the root zone, and um, that's very important. Um, that happens right away. And we we pre-irrigated well before we uh, plant, which is why they can plant trees so quickly, because the ground is, is not soaked, but it's wet. So it's it's you know, pliable, if you will. Um, very important to remember, too. Uh, tree wraps are important. We do those about after our 24 hour dries out. Um, two, three days later, and that's for sunburn and for suckering, uh, which suckering is when the uh, undesirable part of the rootstock shoots off, um, and we're, we're gonna sucker those out because it's it's cheaper um, to put wraps on to prevent or reduce the amount of suckers that come than it is to go through over and over and over and suck it by hand. You cannot suck it any other way than by hand. Um, and that being said, we will still sucker about two times a year with a tree wrap for the next three years. Versus not having a tree wrap, you can only imagine how many times it would be. Corey, Corey, going back to the straws, um, how do you guys know where to put the straws? Sure. So, um, as I was saying, uh, the the contractor has a, a surveying piece of equipment, and um, as a, uh, a land surveyor, right? So you're going to have uh, a point A and a point B, and he's shooting it to square up this piece of ground, and he's getting essentially a, a square ground, and then they have pre-made um, long, it's not string, it's, it's rope, and it's, so for example, uh, very common now, a mandarin or a clementine is planted an eight by 20 foot spacing. So that means there's a row every 20 feet and then there's a tree every eight feet in that row. And so this contractor would have a preset row in um, whatever you choose to, to plant, or however you choose to plant. So in our case, an eight by 20. So there would be a, a after you square it up and you have your four corners, that's very important with the surveyor uh, piece of equipment. Then uh, this rope is led across with 15, 20 guys and on the entirety of the row, and they'll be walking against the row to the, to the next row, um, and there's a mark on each piece of every eight feet, and they'll put a straw, and they'll walk to the next row, walk to the next row, walk to the next row, for the entirety of the, of the order. Of the quote ranch, whether that's 10 acres or 25 acres. Um, so it, it is very, and you know, we go out and measure with 10 acres uh, to see if it's accurate, and, and it is. It's quite amazing um, on how, how good these guys are, because that's all they do. They they plant citrus, pistachio, almonds, 
drapes everything you can think of year round. And they'll, they move up and down in California. It's a select number of individuals that still do that, um, which is another reason to push for mechanical straw and plant. Um, does that answer? I was a little longer <laughs> answer. Yeah, that's good. But that's still, cool. Yeah, it's not done mechanically. It's not marked mechanically. It's marked with the rope. Right, and there are, there are contract um, individuals uh, that you know now are doing it mechanically. We historically have never done that, and we're getting into it uh, this year and next year. So it's a newer thing for us, um, but the cost savings is just so large. So it will be in the near future. Is it a piece of equipment that we can sell? No, I don't think so, because you can sell the tractor, um, but the equipment is all handmade from these, um, there's, that I know of, two, three individuals that, um, that have been doing it for 10, 15 years, and so they've got a dang good science. I think mean, it'd be very difficult to manufacture, um, because it's just, it's such a niche thing. Um, that you have to have more individuals interested in, in doing that. And they're going to be building their own equipment and fixing their own equipment, whatever it brings. Because um, no manufacturer has ever widely made it. Does that answer? Yes, it does. Any other questions on that? You said the plant time was an hour and a half? Yeah. You know, like your window before? Well, so we're planting in, a good, good question, um, May, June, July, um, so it's very hot during that, you know, triple digits, which ideally we're not, you know, we're going to be looking at the, the forecast, and ideally we're going to plant uh, overnight, but, you know, we can, and so the pre-irrigated ground helps um, the moisture in the air, and so with those trees being laid out, we want to get in the ground as soon as possible. And with these guys, they they straw and they plant, and that's that's what they do. And um, they get paid on a piece rate, so they want to finish quickly. And we we want you know them to finish as well to get the tree in the ground to then irrigate it. Um, and it it just happens to be with about a if you're doing you know twenty thousand trees, you'll have two crews of 20, 25 people. And then we'll take it back down. Um, I'd say we would never want a tree to be out in the middle of the orchard during the day because it's a the tree has a um, well you can see it has a, a sock that that sock's made out of um, coconut fiber and um, there's so it's you know, biodegradable and uh, where you just have root and look at the soil. Um, so you don't want it to, to stay outside for very long in triple digit weather because it would dry out the tree would die before it's planted. Um, good question. Yeah, that's so our, our really no more than two hours is important for us. Corey, you mentioned earlier how much you pay for the straws, fifty cents. What do they get for a tree to plant? Like, the plant the tree. What is the individual? Yeah. Of that fifty cents? Um, they're getting they're getting that. Um, the contractor is getting that. Sorry, I'm sorry. 50 cents for the straw. Is it the same for the tree? Or? Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Um, to put the, you're saying, what are they getting to plant the tree? Right? And right. then what are they getting to put the, tree, the straw in the ground? It's the same cost, virtually. Um, so they're, they're getting about 42, 44 cents for a straw and about 50, 55 cents um, for a tree. So it, it's similar. Um, a little bit more, but their motivation is high because they can get paid very quickly, um, and, and that's their day, um, and, and they're gone. Uh, so, could it be all different citrus varieties being planted from May through July? Yes, and people will push that farther. You know, they'll push that um, April. People will push that even to. Uh, September, I mean, people have different opinions on when to plant. Um, I would never plant a citrus tree. It, you know, a citrus is an evergreen, so it doesn't go dormant. 
So you don't want to plant it in the winter because if you plant it in December, November, December, um, you're not going to have enough root structure for when you get a frost and it'll kill the tree. Um, versus that's the only time you plant almonds and pistachios is in the winter because of it. So it, you know it's a different different game. Um, the opinion on the best time to plant largely is going to be on also who's in charge, um, but also when you can get the tree. We can only physically get 20,000 trees because of logistics and trucks and nursery a day. And that's coming from two different nurseries at 10,000 each nursery. So it's, it's um, logistically uh, a big deal on you know, the time of year. Is the tree ready? We're going to the nursery and looking at it to see if it looks healthy enough to take it out eight or nine months or seven months if we can, depending on how it did in the nursery. Um, so that, it's a wider gap than um, those three months. <coughs> But not necessarily because you want it to be, because you don't have a choice. If you want to get that tree in the ground, you may fudge and go a little bit earlier or a little bit later. <coughs> is, the, is the summer being sprayed for in San Joaquin Valley? Um, only when they find it. It's only being, um, when, when there's enough, well, in residential, they're not being sprayed, they're just clipping up the tree. They have permission from the Food and Drug Administration. But there hasn't been any positive on a commercial grown citrus crop. So, no, they're not being spread. In Southern California, where there is positive findings, yes, of course, they're being spread. But when I address my question is, is does one square work better than another? Are they washing the tree like they do for scale, or? Yeah, no, I'd say no. One, one spray doesn't work better. I mean, we, we on our end, we don't know a whole lot about it in this area um, because we haven't had it. But down in you know, Southern California and Florida and California, in Texas and all this stuff, they're just using um, any electroblast spray, spray or any sort of um, high volume of water sprayer that you can think of. Um, it, it doesn't matter which one because they're just trying to get it on before it affects um, the whole version. You mentioned you could treat it for irrigation as well. How does that work? Yeah, so that's, it's not you can, if you have it, you've got to treat it foyer spray and through so there's um, a couple of approved products that that really they're not they're not meant for um, the Asian sister ceiling, um, but but it does help. Uh, it'll push them back so the glass is in the sharpshooter, and and what it does they the roots will take up um, this this chemical and. Um, Somehow, the females, which are the ones that mainly carry this disease, um, have a, a, an effect by the pheromones. Think of similar to, um, well, there's like Sotera and um, Simios are the two number one players in uh, disrupt pheromone breeding. And uh, that's, that's how uh, a chemical form of that and, and I'm not the, the best one because we, we just don't have any yet, so I haven't firsthand been able to, to see that as much. But according to um, the UC Extension, um, there's a couple of approved products to be applied uh, that, that is working, but, but it's not, it's pushing back the population, but it's not getting rid of the population. Does that answer a little better? Yeah, I'm just curious. So it's fair well made instruction. Right. So that's, and that's, I mean, it's helping, but it's, it's still so new. They, we're coming out with stuff all the time um, to try to, because there's no cure. So they're, they're willing to try more things than you, than you can think of. They're still safe, of course, but that just haven't, you know, historically been known to, to kill or affect that um, psyllid that they will drop. Because it could have some similar characteristics that may work. Uh, uh, 
it is dirty. Um, and when I say dirty, it, it, it's just dirt. It's normal. Um, it's a normal occurrence. It's, it's not. Uh, the water is still treated. Um, we also treat it on our end at the filter site with sulfuric acid uh, or other, other ways of um, treating the water to affect the pH um, or to break down the minerals that are inside, especially in the deep well that could affect and put the lines. So that's understanding of um, overall understanding of irrigation. Um, some more, I mean, weather stations are huge for us. We have weather stations, uh, we have 60 weather stations up and down some of that. Wonderful for us. Um, and that's a, that's a big deal uh, because we can see when the weather's coming and what we'll talk about later, but in, um, especially in the winter when we're trying to protect the crop from the freeze, the weather stations are in dire. I mean, we, you have weather reports, um, but when you can see it on your ranch, I have um, the capability to get text messages from the weather stations whenever um, it, the, the weather, the temperature uh, goes below my set parameter, um, and then I would you know, get the text message. I got one this morning at four o'clock in the morning. Um, and uh, if it's early enough, I mean, I, I'll talk about that later, but weather stations are very important. Um, the pressure volume chamber um, is what we're measuring, um, the pressure of the tree's leaves, which would affect our, our um, and we have our proprietary um, desirable parameters that, um, I would say proprietary, but it's, that's the wrong, wrong terminology. Uh, our historical data that we've collected um, that works for us. Um, the UC extension has has good data, but I, I think you know we're in such volume, uh, 30, over 30,000 acres in the Central Valley. We have the ability to um, affect ourselves, you know, same day, next day. Um, and Soil Pro, Soil Moisture Pro, yeah, same tech that you guys know is just a brand, um, but that's that's uh, what we use. Um, and you know, that helps us if we can at least see um, you know, moisture at different depths. And, and then all your courses also um, kind of uh, you're truth checking what the soil code tells you on the computer. I think what's very important is to remember all three, all four of these are just tools. And what I was taught, you know, tools in the toolbox, but you have to understand what is more or most beneficial for you to make the best decision. One of these alone will not help you better. You need all of these together to be able to make um, an irrigation schedule um, for your given area, which is going to be completely different across the Central Valley or, or in Ventura or in the desert or you know, even in um, Texas is completely different. Mexico is way different. It's just so different on you know, where you're at and the amount of rainfall that we get, even within a mile radius, is very different. Uh, and you know, don't really, it doesn't really affect an individual unless you're in farming to understand, like, oh my gosh, you know, here I got an inch, way over there I got a half an inch. That's going to affect the land in the area next week. So, I mean, that's all. These are just tools and. They help you make an educated decision on the how you need to do your thing. Um, yeah, this is you know, very important. Fertilization is huge in citrus. I mean, we use a lot of nitrogen in citrus. We're using about 120 pounds of nitrogen per acre per year. Uh, that's that's huge. How much was that? What did you say? How much was it? How much nitrogen did you use? We hit area. Of? I oh. said area. Oh, sorry. Okay. I guess I'll. I felt like I was yelling already. <laughs> um, we use about 120 pounds of nitrogen a year on mandarins and clementines per acre. Um, and we use about. Excuse me. I said that for my. See, I wrote it down. I said that for. We use 155 pounds of nitrogen on sometimes in manners an acre a year. We use about, um, you know, NPK uh, is the 
the macronutrients, as you can see, right, and um, potassium, phosphorus, nitrogen, and, and so we're using about 155 pounds of N, 20 pounds of P, which you can see, uh, sorry, you can, right, so see that, phosphorus, and then potassium, we're using about um, 75 pounds an acre. And that's, that's the, the macronutrients. We won't even get into the micronutrients uh, very much. But that's, that's very common across the board in, in agriculture, those three key um, components. And, and for an understanding this further, because it's reduced, um, Naval's Valencia's are going to use about 110 pounds of nitrogen, um, about 20 pounds of uh, phosphorus per acre per year and about 40 pounds of potassium. Um, and that's, so it's, you know, it's a huge amount of fertilizer. Huge amount of inputs is what they, those are, right? So your inputs would be your macronutrients and your micronutrients and your water. And then um, we'll go on, but you know, that's through fertilization, uh, through irrigation systems, and then also what I said is not even including foliar sprays. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, but citrus is a very uh, tedious crop. There's a lot going on. You never really have a slow time to see. Um, filter stations are, are that other picture I showed you, right? So, so in the so you know you have your water you receive from either deep well or a district. Your filter stations are here, and at this ranch, we have a, a gypsum silo um, that's going to be injected through uh, the irrigation system uh, to to have a simplest term for percolation uh, of water into the into the soil. I mean, these tanks right here are going to be um, all your fertilizers. Um, in this case, this ranch had an automation system which is in that sea train so that they can control the water um, on and off um, by their phone. Um, and, right, so you're going to take this fertilizer that's in the tank that you ordered and inject it into the main line um, after the filters. So your water's coming in from the, from the reservoir, going into the filters, and the filters are broken down into different layers of sand, starting with fine at the top and um, you know, rocks at the bottom. And it's, it's naturally filtering the water, taking out all of um, the impurities, all of the uh, grasses, all of, all of the things you don't want um, to go into your hoses because that reduces the amount of time you know, your hoses and drip meters and micro sprinklers um, plug up. So that's kind of a overall general understanding. I mean, be happy to explain more on, on you know, how it gets applied or, or what have you. But that's that's a broad understanding. Um, on yeah, and that's very important. Like I was saying with um, with analysis of the soil, we, we do leaf and soil analysis annually. Um, we're, we're testing about every ranch. Um, well, biannually. So um, we will check every single ranch um, in our desired pattern every other year. Um, that's not necessarily a very common um, occurrence. Somebody's going to check every three to five years. Um, and of course, if we have a deficiency in a tree, um, you, know, you can see an issue with a lot of trees dying in an orchard, which is in my case, um, right now, and so uh, I sent some soil samples out uh, to be analyzed by the by the lab, and then uh, hopefully we'll get something back that we can affect and reduce the amount of tree that um, in in an orchard that I have. Um, so that's very important in, in the plan. So you know, I say the the numbers on average for fertilizer, but it could sway you know probably 20 to 40 pounds depending on what the analysis says, depending on each ranch. Um, so it's 
goes back to the nutrients that are in the soil and what the trees are using on an annual basis. You, you know, if they're using those nutrients to produce a crop, you have to put them back in the ground to hopefully have that same good crop annually. Uh, so that's, those numbers are average, right? But it's, they're not exact. Um, I just did that for an understanding of, of how much fertilizer we're injecting in a, in a particular soil tree. Do you guys have an autonomous fertigation injection system, or like do you have to have somebody there like six hours into the, that cycle, they inject for the next 12 hours, and then and they have another one flush it after let it rain so much time, or how, how do you get to do that? Good question. Yeah, so that's um, going to be dependent on the ranch, on, on what you know you have. Um, so every, we do have some automated injection um, you know, via computer um, that you're pre-setting. The uh, majority of our stuff is not. The um, majority of our stuff is injected manually by an individual. Um, we've had a few programs over the years, and um, I think that the key thing for the technology aspect that's very important to remember is, yes, it may work when it's new, but if it's not regularly maintained by the individual that it was sold, I mean, that, that's the huge part of this business is parts and service after the sale, which you guys all know that, but that's, I kind of explain how important that is in our world um, whenever a piece of technology is sold um, and used in the field. We have, we've gone through different um, fertigation systems that we can't, we had a system from Spain, a couple of systems from Spain on, on one of my ranch, and one of my ranches, and we just couldn't get parts. And we decided to, to do Raven. We had another system from Fresno. That's a, an Israeli-based company that we couldn't get parts, we couldn't get service. So it's the local base companies are more important. We did have a trial with, um, oh my gosh. Um, sorry for the name, I can't think of the name. The sure Fire Marksman? No, no, no. Um, he's off of 58. He's a grower to um, what's his last name? Um, his last name is his company. It started with him. The fertilization system. I'll have to think of it, but he's just off of 58 years. Um, about Mazzy. Mazzy. Thank you, Mazzy. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. So we we used them on a trial base, um, and they just wanted to. To get the data, um, had some issues, and so they decided to, to pull out to, to fix them. So you know we're such a good trial area because of our, our volume annually um, for data points, and you know in that case they just had some more bugs to fix that they wanted to to take it off before um, they tried to even sell it. Um, we yeah so. A lot of it is, is manually injected because of historical issues we've had, mainly because of parts and service. Um, I think some of those companies are getting better and, and understanding that you know, we're not going to deal with that um, because we don't have the time. Because when we need it, we need it now. And um, that's, that's very important. Um, so in a long run, right, so um, see a 12, 15 hour run, um, 18 hour run, depending on how hot all of the previous slides that we talked about, um, we're going we're gonna to irrigate um, the majority of that run, so say 12 hour run, and then when it gets to about uh, the 10th hour, um, we're going to inject, um, and then we're going to run uh, the final two hours of that run to flush the lines. Um, and that is not the best approach, but in our volume of fertilizer and in our the regularity, you know, we're injecting two to four months of fertilizer a month in our peak, which would start at the end of this month up until September. Um, so it's it's a lot of fertilizer. So these the the purge injections are has been the most effective for us, even though we know the chemistry behind it, but that's not the best way. The best way is to inject a little bit during the irrigation. But that's also um, an issue when the controller of the um, technology you know, doesn't work or breaks or what have you. So 
with manpower, we can we know that it was at least injected in the main line. Um, and we're trying to grow the best, highest quality crop. And to date, that would be our solution. Because you know, we're, we're, we'll try anything, but um, it's that's a constant battle for sure. Um, are they drawing like a line on the size of the tank for this set? Do you use that much? Or they have like a siphon? What was the best practice? Sure. Sure. The easiest practice, uh, most cost effective is drawing a line, right? Because that doesn't cost anything. Um, can you ask a question? Anyone, can you speak up a little bit so we will the back here? Right. Or just turn around? The question was what's the most effective way to measure the fertilizer that's injected into the main line? Do you draw a line or is there a siphon? Um, and I said the easiest way that's the most common practice for us right now is drawing a line with a Sharpie that you injected. You know, I'm telling my my workers, right, um, hey, you know, we're gonna inject X amount today at this time, and they're gonna mark it out um, on the tanks, and then they're gonna you know inject until the bottom of the line is, so you're going to have two lines right start and finish, um, and that's the simplest way. Um, we have started to look at some, some uh, technology for um, essentially a mini flow meter at the bottom of the fertilizer tank um, to, to register um, how much fertilizer is it actually leaving that tank, um, and assuming going into the field. So. Um, Yes, there's always new things to, to try, for sure. Um, and the tough situation with that is to try during the off season, but then you don't have the actual experience um, that you need when you want to, when it's, it's season. So from the end of February to um, September, and I think it's gonna be an ongoing battle on, on you know, in theory, you have an understanding of, okay, I'm gonna inject you know, 200 gallons today, right? And you, you went into the main line, which that's all you know. And you have, of course, uh, sub-main valves, um, which branch off into different areas of the ranch. So you know if that sub-main is closed, this one's open, it's going into that direction. But you truly don't know, and you, in today's standards, you will never know how much one tree got. You have a calculation of what you need for the acre based on the amount of trees per acre, but I mean, one can believe that the closest tree got more fertilizer than the tree at the end of the line. Because, and, and that's something that we can't measure, um, and, and that's where you're trying to grow you know, masses, um, and, and we tend to, to be okay with that right now because it's, it's done fine historically. Um, but. We do not know that you know, that tree got that much fertilizer on this day exactly too possible. And I have uh, like 150,000 trees. No way to That's wrong. Um, on one ranch, I have 100,000 trees. So. Um, but, so yeah, we'll never know that. We're trying to do the best we can with um, what we have, and we're always looking for new technology and new opportunities to to better inject um, fertilizer. Um, so with that being said, do you find at the end of the line the trees, the production, the growth, the quality, is there a difference? Is that how you get this data? No, so yes, there is a difference, but it's not consistent enough to want us to try to, to ensure that each tree is getting X amount of fertilizer. Practice. That was in the corn time, which is different a little bit from manners. This year we did go through and we took off about, we, we manually size pick with fruits and went through, I think we're like spinning with cherries on um, probably peaches even, um, stone fruit, right? Mm -hmm. And we went through and, and manually, fruit that was never going to size up. It costs less money to, to get it off in the field than it does to pick it, ship it, run it through the shed, and then kick it out of the shed. So we're saving $100, um, huge savings. Um, 
on spruce, it's never going to size up. You need to so have right different sizes. Um, the higher the number, the smaller it is, and you're not going to sell a lot of small stuff ever. The market is it's good fruit. Market. Doesn't. So this year we did go through um, after the fact and you know drop stuff on the ground, and then before as well before we take. Mm -hmm. We go up there and take three or four times, two times. It could be three times max. Um, yeah, so you'll go through. You might go through and drop some food and then take three or four times and then drop more food at the end. No. So you, if you don't, well, I don't know if this is interesting. I speak up. Enough. It, so, depending on the crop, there is mandarins and clementines do have alternating bearing years, similar to pistachios, but not as bad. Um, so, navels, valencias have historically the same crop every year, but um, we're seeing now as more data comes in that there's alternating bearing years in clementines and mandarins. It's an easy peel market, and um, we will go through beforehand. We did this year, seeing we were going to have an overloaded tree that the market's not looking that great. We went through and we, with crews, took fruit off the tree uh, that was never going to size up to what the market wants that we could sell for. So it's cheaper to do that in the field. And then uh, we went through and picked. Um, and we that would have been the color and size pick. So um, depending on the day of the sales, you may, you know, 32, 34, 36, 38, 40. We won't ever go smaller than a 40. The, the numbers are deceiving because the higher the number, the smaller the fruit is. Um, but that's, um, we would color and size depending on what we want to fulfill the order. And um, if this, this color is correct, so clementines we can gas the color, so we'll pick them when they're green. Mandarins you cannot, it does not have the same chemical reaction. So we would pick for color and size, and then uh, we would go through, like in this case, we, we pick, uh, we thinned out the crop before with the crew, we color size, and there's gonna be one more strip is what you call it. So you'll pick, um, you won't necessarily pick all the fruit and not do a picture of stripe or are you picking to fill a certain order for size? Yeah, I mean, you're picking to fill a certain order for the size. If you have multiple orders, then it doesn't matter as much. Um, but yes, I mean, You'll be in the field three to four times, whether that's including, you know, thinning out one of those or not thinning it out, you'd still pick three times. If it's a heavy crop, you're gonna go on colored size, you could pick again, and then you'll go in the strip. So the fruit will get picked if it's ripe, if it's big or small, and it's ripe, it'll get picked and then just get the size bigger. Well, if it's not the correct size that we want, we'll kick it out because different buyers want different sizes. The Walmarts, you know, the number one buyer for every single commodity of, you know, fresh commodity is Walmart, 100%. And um, that's across every single commodity. And, um, and, uh, you know, they may want a different size that, you know, uh, smaller niche sprouts or somebody else wants a smaller size or a different size or what have you. So if we know what we're, what size we require, we can be more lenient because it'll just get kicked out to a different, to fulfill a different order in our packing house. Um, if we're very, you know, specified, it depends on the market. If it's a heavy crop year, I mean, there's so many... Uh, different things that could occur. Uh, um, 
like in, in our case, the market was terrible. So we left in out of the 8,000 acres I was telling you, we left 600 acres of crop untouched, threw it on the ground this year. That's, that's bad. I mean, that's about $5,000 farming cost on average, we threw on the ground. 5,000 an acre, so you know, 5,000 times 600, that's huge. Amount. Do you let the baggers come in and get it then to sell the corners <coughs> at that point? Or do they get their kick back? Or how do they get their bags in the corners? They're getting that stuff from the... <laughs> yeah, they're we yeah they're getting that stuff from, from cold at the cold stuff C U L L E D right cold stuff at the packing house um, that still looks good or whatever you know that's why these fresh farmers market that's not where you want to buy your citrus um, that's the you know the number twos that's the seconds that they're fine but. Um, they, they still taste good. They don't look as good. Um, or they'll steal them. We get that all the time. Um, we, have, we have security um, all the time at our ranch because we get robbed and stalking. Um, but yeah, so that's a good question. But they're getting it from, they're buying it from the packing house. So the packing house didn't want it for the market um, at a lower cost. We don't do that, but many other packing houses do that. Mm -hmm. uh, we're trying to protect the market, the brand, I should say. That's more important. So we'll, we'll call beautiful fruit because it's too small. Mm -hmm. And in this case, we threw, yeah, like I said, six, five, six, seven acres. And then about 1,500 acres, we thinned out this year. Do you guys use outside labor contractors or are they all applied from wonderful? All outside contractors. We have, for harvesting, we have you know, H2A workers. That is a hassle, but very helpful. Um, we use a lot of them. But, you know, we're, we're setting up housing, we're applying for documentation, we're giving them a per diem. They're working hourly, right? Versus, a, and that's through a contract labor as well. Um, versus uh, uh, a local individual um, is gonna be on a per bend basis. So, you know, your quality is always better in H2A workers because you're telling them, you know, what you want and they don't care how long it takes because they know they're gonna be there for eight or nine hours. The bend guys, in their mind, they have a calculated price on what they wanna make per day, $120, $150. When they hit that mark, because they had, you know, X amount of bends that it required based on the price of the bend for that day, they're out. They'll walk out at six hours because they made their money that they wanted that day. Um, very calm. I mean, very interesting. But they, pickers and planters are the hardest working workers, manual labor workers I've ever seen. They're amazing. Do you guys have your go-to contractors? Uh, may or may not know the answer for that. I hear from a lot of my guys that say, I was going to work a wonderful this year, so we need five articles, and all of a sudden it's like, oh, they didn't give us a contract. They gave us somebody else or whatever. Sure. For me, I, I wouldn't know that. I mean, I know the contractors that we've been using for years. We use the big players. And, and Eddie, I want to, you know, congratulate you because in almost four years, I've never seen a KMI sticker Harlo until this year. And I've seen hundreds of Harlo. That's a big deal. That's a, that's a big deal. I've seen a lot um, with KMI logo on um, because you know, it's, a, it's a first hold heavy um, historically market on the Harlows until this year. So that's uh, entry to that market um, you, you've made. Um, but but yeah, so a lot of it has to do with what contractors can get people. Um, and if they commit to X amount of people and they don't fulfill that, they'll get kicked out for the next contractor. 
Um, because, you know, if you say you have X amount of people and you don't, and that's a lot all the time happening, why am I going to go to you? I'm going to go to the next guy in line who's been on the waiting list for a year, two years. Um, so, yeah, that's H2A. So, I mean, you, you know, you're going to have like, you have H2A guys that are going up and down California. Um, you have home labor contractors um, that are local, but also go up and down in the Central Valley. Um, we do not harvest any of our stuff, our own. Um, they are 100% contract laborers, whether that's a contract labor H2A or a contract labor bin. So hourly <coughs> H2A or bin, uh, cost. So uh, the liability and the ability to find people just hasn't been our, that's why we shy away from it. Um, 100% of our manual pruning is contract labor. Um, you know, I have, yeah, we'll, we'll start, but I have, I have 1,500 acres and I have five guys and then three FLCs. And we're doing all that with that irrigating, fertilizing, all that with that, those guys, right? So depends on your, I, I had, the most I ever had, because I've moved areas, was 12 guys. Um, that was because we were irrigating a lot of acres at once. That's the only need why you need more people. Um, but yeah, I mean, we're doing a lot with a little bit of people. Uh, and we're paying more than anything. So, um, yeah, we'll start. My, the focus with all the slides before was to give a, you know, in-depth understanding of citrus farming, we're gonna go through these slides pretty quick. Um, the other document that's somewhere that Katie gave is um, was that spreadsheet, which would be more helpful if you could get the spreadsheet later on the, the equipment and you know the sprays and everything. Because right now, at least the way I printed it out um, is kind of confusing to look at. So if you looked at the Excel spreadsheet, you know, from her, she could send it to you or what have you, and you'd see kind of a long. Um, it just didn't print out super well on my end. I printed these out. Maybe it looks better on yours. You guys all have it in the back of your slides, or in the back of yeah, your slides. There's three pages. And we're, they should be congruent with the months at each at the front of each page. Yeah, and that's that was kind of the goal right now was you know broad, and now we'll go through months, um, which is just going to be quicker. Um, so right now, February, like I said, we're you know we're harvesting manners, navels, lenses, and lemons. Um, we're still considered frost season. Uh, frost season is, um, well, we have a picture. Uh, so I'll explain that a little later with, with the picture, but um, that's when we're protecting the crop from about uh, mid-November until end of February, could lead into March, beginning of March. Um, and when I say protecting the crop, um, we have wind machines that are 30 feet high. You have an inversion layer at 30 feet, about three to four degrees difference, only to the Central Valley. It doesn't exist in Texas or Mexico or any of that. Um, Central Valley in Northern California has it a little bit, and you're trying to push the three to four degrees and it's warmer up top at 30 feet down. In each wind machine, you see that these, these fans, I'll, I'll show you a picture in a minute. Um, and those are powered by, uh, engine could be electric or it could be an uh, engine uh, fueled by propane or diesel um, or gas it just depends on there's a million different variations um, and then we're also going to you know run water so um, water at coming out of the deep well is about 68 degrees on average well if it's freezing 32 degrees outside then you know your water is warmer than the outside air temperature and irrigating on the trees is going to bring the temperature up about three to four degrees. So the combined three to four degrees of the wind machine and the combined three to four degrees of um, of uh, the water will will help. It will help um, in a 32, 35 degree um, temperature. So 32 is freezing. Um, that does affect our fruit uh, because you know, you know water. A piece of fruit is like 90 percent water. So 
Uh, if you freeze and water, the quality of the fruit suffers, um, and the shelf life is not the same. Um, and it's detrimental if your crop freezes. Um, all of your inputs you've been doing every the rest of the year is, is now worthless. Um, and so those are the two ways to to affect um, frost, wind machines, irrigation. Uh, we will pre-irrigate if in the forecast it's going to be down um, for long periods of time. That's key. If it's below freezing for more than four hours, you better be testing your fruit to see if you have quality issues. Because you can see that morning if your, your crop is starting to freeze. And then you're gonna be you know, running through the house certain areas, um, and that's what I mean where you have pockets of cold, um, very important that you catch it before it's, it's um, if you have an issue, you catch it to see how bad the issue is. We also have crop insurance. A lot of outside growers have crop insurance. Um, it's very important in the citrus world. Um, and also, so that started in November, um, but it's currently going on. Uh, we're starting to irrigate the end of February and we're going to start fertilizing our mannas and our clementines. And you go on, like I was talking about on the sheet, um, it, it kind of further explains this. Um, on equipment, you know, we're going to be using um, forklifts, quads, tractor sprayers, um, and then also we're going to start applying V-nets towards the end of the month. Um, and we're going to also have a nutrition spray. Um, and that's all going on in February. Um, this is a V-neck. Uh, we originally partnered with Andros Engineering uh, many years ago and came up with a completely custom uh, V-neck platform. And uh, the V-netting is required in clementines and some mandarin varieties because uh, cross-pollination, so during this time, what also is going on is you have bees because of pistachios and almonds that require them for, you know, many, um, yeah, you have the varieties that don't require bees, but for almonds and pistachios, and so we don't want the bees because the bees will come and cross-pollinate into our clementines or some variety of mandarins. And if bees equal seeds, we don't want seeds. So our remedy to that is we put nets on the entire orchard, row by row by row. Um, and that is why you have a seedless mandarin. Um, up to how long can we keep the net, nets up? Sure, we keep them up. Uh, great question, can you explain that? We, we put them on before bloom, and they are completely left on until 100% petal fall. Petal fall means in the bloom. And then after that, we're not in fear of the, the bee cross-pollinating, so they, they will take the nets off. Is that four weeks, six weeks? Up to six weeks. And you don't want to leave it on longer because uh, then you're having shade, which is also a negative effect on the tree because you need photosynthesis. Yeah. What pollinates the bees don't? Nothing. So, so, so pollinate? Yeah. Yeah, and there is a variety, um, the, the February mandarin variety that doesn't require um, nets. Uh, it's just a different, in the breeding process, um, they can say they did it on purpose, but they got lucky. And, um, and he was a good breeder and you know, knew what he was doing, but um, one in 10,000 is, a, if you have a one commercial variety out of 10,000 tries, then you're a good breeder. So. Um, they were trying for those characteristics to not require nets, and it happened, and that's what um, a tangle is. So the tangles will never be netted. They do not have seeds. It does not matter if bees cross pollinate. Um, March, stone to harvest, mandarin, navel, lynchy lemons. Um, so I was talking about that. Um, uh, Pheromone disruptor, um, Calvin Red Scale is at this time of the year, uh, we would be dispensing their little, uh, the company we use is also a uh, sister company, Sotera. And um, so we have the product, it's called Checkmate, and um, it, it has the, the pheromones um, in the product and it is put on 
each tree. Um, you have a pattern and a, and a required need per acre, um, and that's what we're manually doing with crews, and that has been effective the last three to five years, and we're annually doing that, and that is cheaper than having detrimental damage by red scale that you can't sell your crop, um, or less costly than spraying multiple times a year. Um, so it, it doesn't mitigate completely, but it definitely helps. What does red scale do to the crop? <clears throat> red scale is this piece of fruit. So you have blemishes and the market, piece of fruit tastes great, but it doesn't look good at all. And that's because of, of red scale. So um, it's making those, that's red scale on it, but you know, the little dots is, is an actual red scale, but it's, it's making blemishes on the skin um, that's affecting um, the quality of it from uh, the exterior characteristic. The, the actual quality of the piece of fruit is fine. Red scale is really more good. Yeah, right. correct. And so that, you know, we want to, we don't want that to happen because then we won't be able to sell that piece of fruit. Um, You know, we're irrigating um, from, like I said, February to September, October, depending. Um, still applying V nets. Uh, we have 600 acres of V nets to do, um, and with our new varieties, we're going to have an additional six to 700 acres. That's a lot to do in a short period of time. You have a couple weeks to do that, um, and you know you're doing. You have a tractor and then the rig I showed you, and you have about eight people. So it's, <laughs> we're doing about 10 to 12 acres a day per rig. So you can imagine how many rigs we have, how it's very, it's so important that we get it done before bloom happens, um, before 100% bloom. Because you have 20%, it's not really that worrisome, but we, we start before bloom even starts, but we want to be done at about, no later than 20% of what bloom is on this tree. Um, so with very small window, very important, timing is everything. If you, get, if you don't get it done, your crop's worthless because nobody wants to buy with seeds. Do you buy new nets every season? Every five to seven years. Oh, okay. Get them from China. Does it last that long? Maybe. Depends how the crews did. Um, some nets will last three years. I've seen some nets last year but on average about five to seven years Corey, is there a special tool they use i, I noticed to hold the nets down you guys pull like a little bar with dirt yeah. you do it all by hand or you have like a tractor loader or something good question yeah so shoot they're not i did not okay um so you have uh disc blades on you have a bar mm -hmm. right and then you have a, a Three point on the back of the tractor, and it's connecting to that bar and A frame, uh, Wasco A frame, you call what I'm saying. And um, then you have a, a, a bar, and you have blades on either side, two blades on either side. One's cutting it, one's pushing the dirt out. Um, and then we're going to backfill um, every six, eight feet with crews as they're going through, only so the nets don't blow over, which happens. Then we're coming with some blades to backfill the actual dirt when we're done. How deep? How deep is it? Um, six, eight inches. Not, not too deep, six inches. Um, good question. And that's very important because if you don't cover the nets, the bees will just fly right under. Um, or the wind will knock off the net and the bees will fly right under. So, very important, yeah, good, good catch, good eye. Um, we, you know, nutritional spray as well, which you can see we're on, a lot of times we'll skip nutrition, our first nutritional spray depending on timing, depending on if we can get across all the acres. Um, you know, or I, I can't really talk much on the nutritional sprays when we put in them, to be honest, but that's a foliar spray. Um, right now we, you know, we're using, um, we're just getting into the Gus sprayers. Um, we have a few on order, but um, as a whole, uh, you know, we're using the air fans for everything. 
um, and obviously uh, a cab tractor uh, as well. So um, you're still applying nets. Uh, you know that's common. This is just an overall. You know we have and we have a little more than this now. Um, 60 spray rigs in California, 28 nurse trucks, 13 mixed trailers, 125 <coughs> employees. Those are seasonal employees. Yes, those are wonderful employees, but we only hire them for about nine months, and then they're laid off uh, for about three months. And um, very important, right? So I believe that is a rears? No. I don't know. You sold that, Mike. What, what? That is rears. Okay. All right. And um, so yeah, that's you know we're using that on um, from one to four five year trees. Probably not a five year, but it just depends on the variety and what have you. Um, and um, year round, yeah. So you know as we transition into spray season, which is about now, we'll have our first. We already had our first nutrition spray for lemons. And we'll start spraying in the nighttime because as the weather is gonna start heating up, you know, you don't wanna spray after 95 degrees, so we're spraying in the night. Um, from February to September, October. Um, and so, you know, I'd be working with, um, communicating with, you know, the spray division, um, we're not ordering what we need, and then obviously, you know, I'm I'm middleman with harvesting and, and what have you, and um, moving forward with them. Um, so that's good for an understanding on, on spray, right? So that's important um, for fruit set on clementines, and that's all about timing. We may do up to three um, jib applications. Um, for May, I mean, you have, like I said, it is a second spray um, for fruit set during bloom. So, so this time, right, so we're gonna start applying the nest in February, but truly April and May are when it's doing uh, bloom. And then, so it, it could be longer than six weeks. Um, but bloom is about, about that time. And we, we'll have the nets on longer than that. Spray, is that, that's gibberellic acid? That's gibberellic acid. That's just, yeah, I just threw so a name. Is that toxic to us if we're in the field with it? Um, there's a reentry interval period, yes. Um, but uh, if it's longer than 24 hours by law, you have to post it. So the individual you're talking to, um, you know, representative would, would know better. Um, and by law is supposed to, to notify whoever he's with, he or she. Um, but I mean, that's also if you're rubbing up against the tree, looking inside the crown. I mean, it's not, once it's sprayed and cleared out, it's, it's not effective. Uh, it's, it's not uh, gonna affect you. We're working on a spray rig. Oh yeah, no, for sure. But we, you also have to spray down yeah, good point. Um, if you're working on a spray rig that comes into the shop, um, you should definitely be asking um, the grower or the what have you, um, hey, you know, what were you using of this? Or, Did you neutralize the tank? Or, you know, um, definitely, no, there's, that's very important. Um, most of the times if they rode it via big rig or if it's close by and they, and they rode it to a shop, um, they have to do that. They, they know better, but you can't just assume that. You definitely should ask the grower. Uh, we, we do neutralize and clean it before we rode it, even from one ranch to the next, um, because a, a pathogen could be carried over if you don't. Um, what do you use to neutralize it? Uh, we'll use, um, we have, a couple different products. I can't think of the, name, the dang names right now. Um, but I can get back to them. I can't think of the names. You have to fill the tank up completely and then run it through for so many yeah. minutes? Right. Exactly. Yeah, because otherwise you don't know. You just clean the bottom of the tank. So 100%. Yeah. And then you're going to, you may be spraying that water with the outside of the tank too. Um, 
you know, if the nozzles, right? So, uh, and we clean the nozzles before every spray application at every ranch. Um, even after we move, say we're, say we're spraying 600 acres a night, we finish up and we're going to another ranch, you know, we're going to clean those before we start on another ranch. We're going to clean the machine at the ranch we finished. Um, yeah, I can get back to you on the, I forget that, right? <clears throat> So should we be requesting someone who rents a truck and puts it on the spray rig on the gym rig to, for them to neutralize it before they bring it back? That's a no. I can see it. Don't worry about it. No, it's, it's, it's not that. Don't it's, worry about it. It's not something to worry about. I mean, you really have to be just ignorant or, or no, you'd be stupid. You'd be stupid to get sick from are you neutralizing the chemical itself or the pH? Uh, both, both. Yeah, so the pH we're neutralizing, bringing down uh, with citric acid, right? So our water is eight and a half, nine, and we'll use it, we'll bring it down to about five and a half, six. But the actual chemical after we're done will neutralize it so it doesn't, um, you know, because we may not be using the same material on the same ranch the same night. Um, and then it can counter effect and flood our nozzles or, you know, I've, there's been some interesting things that when the story some older time, old timers have told me when they didn't do that and they had some, what you call burn back on the trees um, and, and uh, really affected the tree um, for the next, that crop year and the next crop year. So, um, Are you going back the other way with like soda ash too or just to bring it down? With just to bring it down so it's a, uh, non-hot product or non yeah no it's a good question but we're, we're bringing it to safe levels yeah right um good question um yeah so june july uh we're topping pruning um topping we use toll um you know those toll toppers i call them wheel of deaths um pretty scary machine but pretty amazing um and Pruning, we're mechanically pruning um, and uh, you know hand pruning as well. We're still in the nutritional sprays, uh, but the equipment is the same for all of this, right? So um, that's kind of why we're just breezing through now. And you have it on your paperwork as well. So this is a tool topper. Um, right now we're doing it. The bottom is a is a hedging picture right there, and uh, this is topping. Uh, you know, we're using a uh, rear shredder 100% um, of the time uh, for our shred because citrus is, is thick and uh, lemons especially are uh, hard equipment and we're, we're shredding some bigger stuff than rears would like us to. So um, can you spread disease with that topper? Can you? Uh, sure, yeah, for sure. So, so is that something I don't know? Um, we sell some toppers, but I mean the the managed people. There's a bunch of managed guys, uh, contract guys that will top. You know, outside growers, smaller growers. Um, they know better than that too. We we clean. Um, we service twice a day our own. Um, so you know we're not in fear of that. But, but yeah, I mean it's yeah. a simple wash down. Um, with hot water is plenty to kill the bacteria that could be there. It may not even be there. It's probably more um, worrisome than you think. But if you're moving from a different region in California, in the Central Valley, it's probably fine. If you're moving from down south, or you know, when I say down south, Ventura or desert, yeah, you definitely may be a concern because you have um, you know other pathogens down there that you don't have here. Or, because it's, it's blended into different zones. Um, and you can't move trees, you can't move fruit without doing certain protocols. So that would be a more of a concern, but local stuff isn't that much of a worry. Um, so yeah, I mean, that's what we do. Um, rear shredder, like I said, um, this is a brush rate that we, Curse does not sell. Um, and that's, what we use if we will go in there with a hedger and, and hedge um, 
the row and then the brush would be down on either in the middle or on one side or the other and this brush pick will come in and you might have to do two passes but you'll get it in the middle of the row and then you'll go back and shred with the rear shredder. Um, saves a bunch of time and, and labor in, in this brush rate. Um, you have to be careful because our guys will tear these up quick um, but we use them all the time. Huge time and money saver for us. Um, yeah, I mean, we're still in topping pruning. June and July are our big day, big months for topping and pruning. Um, road maintenance is a big deal too. Um, we're trying to get roads ready for harvest. 90% um, of our orchard roads are oil paved. Uh, we spend a lot of money in road maintenance. And so we use you know, box scrapers all the time. Um, we're, we're patching our roads with um, ground up asphalt and then we're going through with oil. Um, you know, uh, leftover from the refinery process and laying that on top of the roads. Um, and then coming back in with sand uh, five, seven days later. Um, full rose beetle is, is really for export. Um, so you're gonna have a block that's predetermined that, hey, I'm gonna export this to um, Japan, Korea, whatever. And certain countries require um, a full rose beetle spray for export. Um, even if you don't have any issue in the field currently, they will not accept the product unless you have it documented that you did spray for Fuller Rose Beetle. Um, it'll get rejected at the port. Um, that's what we're going on. Now we're winding down in harvest. Um, you know, we only have a couple things going on. We're still irrigating, fertilizing, pruning still going on, on mainly more on oranges, maples this time. Um, and Valencia's. Um, and we're back to October, and so the cycle all over again. Um, and, you know, this is heavy spray time for us. This is the last big spray that we're worried about. Um, I just kind of explained that. Food drop protection. Um, brown rot is a big deal. You know, brown rot is um, caused uh, when you have low hanging, low hanging branches that are touching the floor. Um, and you'll get the disease um, coming and jumping up, splashing up from rain or from irrigation and get on the fruit. And then you'll literally see, I think I had a picture earlier, but it, it's a brown piece of fruit. It rots from the inside out. Um, we detect it at the packing house with pictures that are shooting like 10,000 a second and kicks it out. But um, we want to reduce that so we can sell more fruit. That's what the wind machine looks like. Uh, we have. We order in uh, truckloads of propane. Um, each one of those tanks is 30,000 gallons. Um, and that's only for uh, 240, minimum 240 acres. Um, some of this stuff could be, you know, one of my ranches that had 120,000 gallons of propane. Um, I mean, it's insane. This is important <laughs> for us, for us, you know, notable years in damage. Um, we haven't had a bad year at Frost in a while. A lot of citrus growers are fearful of that because it's going to happen. Every about seven years it happens. Not a hard freeze. A hard freeze like these two years was supposed to happen once every 50 years. Well, it happened twice in eight. And um, so there's a fear of a light freeze um, any year, any time. Right now because we're due. Um, based on historical um, weather patterns. And talk about that, you know, it's November, so we're gonna hopefully <laughs> get some rain. We're gonna disc under in those um, younger plantings um, for Circle Hero, which um, is important for us too. I mean, this is, a, this is our common herbicide rig, 500 gallon sprayer. Um, it's a PVM supply manufacturing. Um, recently, we've been moving the boom to the front, you know, because the tractor driver can't see if the booms are in, in the rear. And these are actually um, electric right here. And so you're going to use the hydraulic from the tractor pushing out the booms. You're going to manually, um, uh, you know, connect everything and the hydraulic is going to push the ram out. And then this is an electric motor right here that's going to lower the boom. So now, with this adjustment, we can use this spray rig in completely different 
um, spacing of trees. Whereas in the past, we would need different uh, booms size-wise, lengths, because we have a million different planting styles because we have different varieties. So that's a huge time saver for us that we did in-house. Um, and we're starting to convert all of our new rigs to this. Uh, they've talked to them about doing that. I don't think they are very interested, so we've been doing it ourselves. Um, Do you keep the booms on the front or the rear? <clears throat> yeah, sorry. So this is how we buy it on the left, and then we modify it to this. We, so, to the front. How high do you trim from the ground the bottom of the oranges? Sure, a standard um, is knee high. Knee high. Um, knee high for um, anything. Oranges, navels, uh, lances, standard from the time. Knee high. And that's something to think about. You got a berm, right? So, is it knee high from the berm or is it knee high from the floor? Um, generally, it's knee high from the your herbicide sprayer boom get underneath that? Or? Yeah. Yes, exactly. And um, yeah, this would be our pre emergent rig and our post emergent rig. Um, and we'll, you know, pre emergent for, I think I said, yeah, November. So, November, December, what you really want is, you know, before the first big rain for the year. Because we want those um, chemicals incorporated into the soil not have weeds emerge um, and much more cost effective to have a good pre emergent program than it is come back two, three, four, five times a year and spray the post emergent. We'll, we'll kick out about two passes by doing a pre emergent so huge cost savings. Um, December, yeah, I mean really it's frost season. Um, these are, you know, disc and certain layer that we'll use. Um, really, it's disc in young plantings and never after that, most of the times. You do not typically disc in a citrus orchard if you're after it's a full producing because you get enough cover um, in the row that you don't require um, to cut with the disc weeds um, unless you run out the, you got a bunch of rutted out um, rows because of harvesting has been harvesting shortly after the rain, and so that's when we'll come in with the circle arrow or with the disc after the seed uh, to fix it. Um, back to January, so yeah, I mean, pretty common element. Um, and I know that was a lot, but I hope it was, you know helpful because there's, there's just so much going on. There's never, you know, we don't have three months off like an almond grower does. That doesn't exist for citrus. Your 365, you know, 30 days, 12 months. So that's, you get to slow down a little bit if it's not cold, but uh, we, don't, we don't have a slow down. Any questions? What's the time frame from the time you pick, like, to it ends up at the market? Could be two, three days. Could be forty-five days. So you guys don't keep them in storage. We do. Yeah, we do. Exactly. We won't. If it's left overnight in a van outside the field, we won't run. Um, but we will. That's that's more so on Clementines um, because we're going to pick them early when they're green and they're firm, and then we're going to gas them. Um, in in the house for color, um, but you don't have that same chemical reaction with um, oranges or clementines, uh, oranges or mandarins, um, as you do with clementines. So those we can store um, in in the packing house uh, longer in, in storing facilities and fill them as orders. So in that case, you could be picking multiple different sizes, and if an order comes in, you, you know you always pick. It's like at the grocery store, right? When you, um, they're restocking, they push the old stuff to the front. It's the same concept in holding that for 45 days. But it could be out within three days. It could be out within 45 days. After 45 days, it's not worth it. What's the ideal storage temperature for the storage? Oh my gosh. Um, 
Huh? Never asked that question. 60, 40? No, I mean, yeah, refrigerator, but not as cold as the refrigerator. 40s. Um, I mean, I've been, think of like a table grip, I mean, table grip facility would be similar. Um, yeah, they're, they're, they're refrigerated, they're not freezing, so it's above freezing, but I don't know. I've never got that question. 40, 50, 60? Not 60, it's too warm. Um, but lower temperature, just like a refrigerator, it's not longer. You have the ingredient process, does that affect the fruit? Yes. Okay. Um, on, wait, did you say green? Like green? Like in oh, 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 no, no. The, so I eat green from the time all the time. They taste great when you green them. Um, it's not a hard, harmful chemical. It, it's been done um, in many different commodities for years. And it just happened to work in Clementines whenever they tried it. Um, it's, uh, I always butcher how to say it, Epi, um, it's a long scientific name. Um, not F. I, I can't think of the name. But anyway, it's um, it, it doesn't affect. Can you think of what I'm saying now? I can't California. think of the name. It's yeah, but that's a short term for it. I can't think of the scientific name for it. Um, but it doesn't affect um, the taste um, or the quality. You're just picking it. To, so it's ready. So it has the bricks and acid levels are correct, the ratio. It just doesn't have the color. And you're, so you're picking it, and then you're going to green up a piece of fruit so that you can have um, the opportunity to, to ship it somewhere farther or to hold it in the shed. Uh, good question. But yeah, it's, it's fine. And it's not hard. How many acres per foot does a mandarin clementine tree need for the year? Water? Yeah. Three. Three? Three? The less than the almond tree did. Yeah, and then uh, uh, navel is a little less than, I mean, it's not even worth discussing. But it's like two or three quarter, three and a half, but say three for shipping. On average, three.